good afternoon everyone uh, thanks uh, dr jitin uh, for this uh, kind words one and secondly uh, the privilege uh, to be part of this uh, scientific program uh, particular uh, thanks to uh, dr venkat giri and to dr benel and all the team workers who are associated with this uh, program uh, i can't see dr lenet uh, morris is she there good afternoon ma'am good afternoon sir Very audible well. oh very well audible. You, 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 yes i can see you also now and uh, you are very very uh, clearly audible i think we can ask the students to go ahead with the case presentation and then we can okay, uh, sir. yeah fine uh, dr anju and dr linu uh, can you go ahead with the case presentation please yes uh, good evening everyone uh, good evening. case history so our patient is mr gangadharan a 80 year old male hailing from trivandrum Uh, he is a diagnosed case of heart disease and hypertension. And now he is presenting with complaints of swelling in both the groins. Uh, informant is the patient himself and Mr. Raju, the patient's son, who is residing with the patient. And the information they give us reliable. Coming to the history of present illness, uh, our patient noticed a swelling in bilateral groin area, which was initially the size of a lemon. and gradually increase in size over the period of 2 years to assume the current status the swelling uh, he noticed used to increase in size on straining lifting heavy loads and is reduced on lying down uh, there is a, he gives history of associated occasional dragging pain over the swelling uh, there is no history of discoloration of skin over the swelling no sudden severe pain over swelling no discharge from the swelling or swelling elsewhere in the body uh, he has no history of chronic cough with expectoration or evening rise of temperature or chills or significant loss of weight or appetite and there is no history of swelling of legs uh, coming to his past medical history uh, he gives uh, a history uh, 12 years back uh, he gives a history of left sided chest pain with radiation to left shoulder while at work uh, he initially took rest and had some antacids for one day uh, however his symptoms persisted and therefore he went to the hospital where he was found to have some block of cardiac blood vessels on evaluation he was also diagnosed to have high blood pressure since then uh, he was started on some blood thinning medications and antihypertensives then uh, since then he has had occasional episodes of left sided chest pain with even mild exertion 10 years back uh, he underwent some cardiac surgery along with stent placement following which his symptoms have subsided uh, he now has only slight limitation of physical activity and he can manage to climb two flights of stairs by himself his symptoms have not increased in frequency or severity or duration over the past uh, 10 years following this stent placement uh, history suggestive of uh, more than uh, his effort tolerance is more than 4 mets uh, he gives no history of swelling of legs no distension of abdomen or palpitations or dyspnea on lying down there is no bluish discoloration of skin or cough with pink frothy sputum or syncopal attacks he has no history of diabetes mellitus bronchial asthma or renal or liver disease or tuberculosis in the past uh, coming to his drug history as stated by his son he is currently on tap ecosprin 75 mg once daily tap metoprolol 50 mg twice daily tap inalapril 2.5 mg twice daily and tap atovastatin 10 mg uh, at night uh, coming to his personal history he is a reformed smoker he used to smoke about 10 bds per day starting from an age of 25 years and he stopped 12 years back following his uh, first episode of chest pain uh, so that comes to around a pack years of 21.5 uh, he has history of occasional alcohol consumption but he stopped 10 years back following diagnosis of his heart disease uh, he also had history of beetle leaf chewing which he stopped 10 years back uh, his bowel and bladder habits remain unaltered coming to the family history he is the eldest among four children he is married and has two sons uh, he there is history of hypertension in both parents and two of his siblings uh, and history of heart disease in, in one sibling at 50 years of age there is no history of any malignancies in the family uh, so his socio economic status my patient was a manual laborer a load bearer by occupation he stopped working 12 years back following diagnosis of the heart disease uh, he hails from a low socio economic status uh, sir impression Uh, our patient is an 80 year old male a reformed smoker who is a known case of heart disease possibly ischemic heart disease and systemic hypertension 
uh, uh, post cardiac stent placement now presenting with bilateral inguinal hernia and there is no history suggestive of congestive heart failure uh, coming to the general examination uh, he is moderately built and nourished his height is 175 cm weight is 66 kg and his bmi comes to around 21.5 kg per meter square there is no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing generalized lymphadenopathy or pedal edema uh, his skin shows ichthyosis uh, hair and nail is normal his temperature is 98.2 degree fahrenheit measured in the left axilla his pulse rate is 64 per minute regular in rhythm normal in volume and character and there is no radio femoral delay uh, he has vessel wall thickening all peripheral pulses uh, could be equally felt on both sides his blood pressure is 140 by 96 millimeters of mercury measured in the left upper limb in the sitting position and his respiratory rate is 20 per minute regular and abdominal thoracic in pattern coming to the airway examination uh, nose there he has no deviated nasal septum or nasal discharge or crusting uh, bilateral fogging is present on cold spatula test uh, his mouth opening is um, uh, ha is more than two finger breaths he is edentulous and has no artificial dentures. He has poor oral hygiene. His malampathy class comes to three, class three. Uh, the temporomandibular joint admits one finger. Uh, thyromental distance is measured as seven centimeter. His sternum mental distance is 13 centimeters. Uh, his neck movements are full in all directions and his spine is non-tender. No obvious abnormalities were noted. Uh, coming to local examination of the swellings. Uh, on inspection, there is a globular swelling in the right inguinal region, uh, about 6 into 5 centimeter size, not extending into the scrotum. And there is impulse on power present over the swelling. Skin over the swelling appears normal. Uh, in the left inguinal region, also, there is a globular swelling, 4 into 4 centimeter, uh, not extending to the scrotum with cough impulse. Uh, there are no visible pulsations or scars or sinuses over the swelling on both sides. Uh, on palpation, uh, inspection findings were confirmed. And uh, in the right inguinal region, a, region, a globular swelling, 5 into 5 centimeter size, not extended to the scrotum was found. It was non tender to palpation and there was no local rise in temperature. The swelling is reducible and cough impulse is present. Uh, on three finger test, impulse is felt at the superficial inguinal ring on both sides, suggestive of direct inguinal hernia. And deep ring occlusion test revealed uh, uh, swelling appearing medial to the deep ring, again suggestive of direct inguinal hernia on both sides. Uh, on the left, uh, globular swelling uh, is of size 4 into 4 centimeters, not extending into the scrotum. There is no local rise in temperature uh, and it is non tender to touch. Skin over the swelling is normal and cough impulse was present and swelling appears reducible. Coming to his systemic examination, uh, examination of the cardiovascular system. His pulse rate is 64 per minute, regular in rhythm, normal in volume and character. Uh, his vessel wall appears thickened. And there is no radiofemoral delay and all uh, pulses could be felt equally on both sides. His blood pressure is 140 by 96 millimeters of mercury in the right upper limb in sitting position and his jugular venous pulsation is not elevated. On inspection of the pycodium, uh, shape appears normal, apex beat could not be localized. And there were no other visible pulsations or dilated veins or scars or sinuses over the precordium. On palpation, apex beat was localized to the fifth left intercostal space in the midclavicular line. Uh, there were no other pulsations felt or any uh, uh, no other pulsations felt. Uh, no left parasternal heave or thrill. On percussion, the right heart border corresponds to the right sternal border and the left heart border corresponds to the apex. On auscultation, uh, first and second heart sound were no, uh, heard normally in all areas. Uh, there were no S3 or S4 and no murmurs. Coming to his respiratory system, uh, the upper respiratory tract, uh, nose appears normal. There is no deviated nasal septum or nasal discharge, uh, no paranasal sinus tenderness, and throat appears normal. Uh, on inspection of the chest, the trachea appears central. Apex beat was not visible. Uh, there is no supraclavicular or suprasternal hollowing. His respiratory rate is 20 per minute, regular, and his abdominal thoracic in pattern. His chest movements are bilaterally equal in all uh, auscultatory areas and no dilated veins or pulsations or scars over the chest wall. Uh, on palpation, there is no local rise of temperature. The trachea is central. Apex beat localized at the fifth left intercostal space in the mid clavicular line. Uh, chest expansion is uh, measured as 2 cm at the level of nipple. His chest movements are bilaterally equal. On percussion, resonant note, note is heard over uh, bilateral, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, mammary, 
axillary, infraaxillary, suprascapular, interscapular, and uh, infrascapular areas on both sides. Auscultation uh, on auscultation, a normal vascular breath sounds were heard in all areas on both sides. His chest was clear and no added sounds were present. Uh, coming to examination of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, mouth and throat, he is edentulous. His gums show nicotine staining and he has poor oral hygiene. Uh, abdomen inspection. Uh, his abdomen was scaphoid, umbilicus is central and inverted. All quadrants move equally with respiration. There were no dilated veins or scars or sinuses over the abdomen. Hernial orifices, swelling, both inguinal areas, as uh, described earlier, uh, was found in local examination. Uh, palpation, abdomen is soft and non-tender to touch. His liver span, uh, liver is palpable 1.5 centimeters below the right costal margin. There was no splenomegaly. On percussion, upper border of liver was percussed at the fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line. Uh, the lower border of liver uh, was percussed 1.5 cm below right costal margin and the liver span uh, comes to around 12 cm. On auscultation, normal bowel sounds were heard. There were no brewery. Uh, coming to the central nervous system examination, his higher mental functions were found to be normal. He has no focal neurological deficit. The sensory system, reflexes and gait appear normal. Mm. So summary, our, uh, our patient is an 80-year-old male, a known case of systemic uh, hypertension and ischemic heart disease, post-cardiac stent placement, an ex-smoker now presenting with bilateral inguinal swelling, possibly direct inguinal hernia, which is uncomplicated, and he is posted for elective hernia repair surgery. Thank you so much for uh, the case presentation. So it's a bilateral inguinal hernia in a patient who is uh, hypertensive, who has coronary artery disease, and uh, he has had some stent also placed a few years back. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, you said it's, it's, a, it's a bilateral hernia. Generally, uh, there is a cause to the development of hernia in a patient who is uh, this old. And you have ruled out all those causes. Yes, sir. One, uh, let me give you a bit of hint. See, the patient is either going to have chronic cough, he's a chronic smoker, and you have said that he doesn't have cough and no chronic cough with expectoration, point taken. The second point that you said was that the uh, patient doesn't uh, have uh, any urinary complaints as well. Sometimes these patients, I mean, 80 years old man, uh, is likely to have some sort of uh, prostatic enlargement. And, uh, you know, that is going to make urination difficult for him. Uh, so that may be another reason why the patient is straining. Either he is coughing badly or he is straining uh, because of which the hernia appears. Or, uh, you know, anything that makes the person increase the intra-abdominal pressure. It may be a chronic constipation as well. So all these factors you have ruled out. I do not deny the fact that in spite of... I mean, in, in, even in the absence of all these factors, patients can still have hernia. It's not that a patient cannot have hernia, but I think one of the factors, if it had been positive, would have correlated very well with the history that we have. If presented the history very well, I, I fully appreciate that. But this was something which uh, appeared to me that could have uh, uh, crossed with the uh, eventual diagnosis that we have. All right. So, you know, this is an old man, he's about 80 years. So, uh, what are your main uh, problems here? Why uh, is a person who is at 80 years of age is specific oh, no. oh, to you rather than a person who is, say, 20 years or 30 years? Uh, All right. If you want me to rephrase that word, why is a geriatric patient of more important or more serious a concern to you as an anesthetist than a person who is 20 or 30 years old. I hope I made it clear. Okay, sir. Uh, mainly my patient being 80 years of age, uh, the main problems associated with this age group is geriatric age. They've got uh, increased incidence of poor warm peace, like uh, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, which is okay. present in my patient. He's a hypertensive. And second thing, they've got a decreased physiological reserve of all uh, organ systems, starting from the cardiovascular, respiratory, uh, and uh, CNS, GIT, liver. So coming to the cardiovascular system, especially my patient, him being advanced age, there's uh, age-related vascular uh, vessel stiffening. 
and so this vessels to me it increases the afterload and uh, that itself increases the myocardial oxygen demand which is detrimental in my patient in uh, in a perioperative setting because it itself makes my patient prone to uh, myocardial further ischemic heart disease fresh in mind then there is also accelerated atherosclerosis at this age which is also a concern because the vessels being stiff they'll be less vaso they will have less beta to mediated vasodilatory response then also uh, uh, at this age group the vessels there is a low cardiac output so low uh, blood flow then he is also an ex smoker which also increases the risk of uh, coagulopathy then uh, all these oh, they yeah. have the uh, vessel in just hold on yes, sir. decrease in the cardiac output occurs say every year approximately mm. it's nearly 1% every year after say about 30 years or so for someone who is at 80 years of age the cardiac output is going to be nearly half of what a 20 year old would have that is approximate so you can make out as to uh, what are you uh, what you are looking at uh, what about the blood pressure you said that pills they get uh, they 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 narrow down and the blood pressure increases so much is the increase in blood pressure uh, you know age wise Age-wise, uh, both both systolic and. It's like about one millimeter of mercury every year after fifty years of age. So you can add up approximately, you will get that uh, value. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other change that happens to a patient who is uh, say eighty years old? Anything Then, happens to the ECG? Yeah, in the coming to the heart condition uh, with age, uh, there is uh, myocardial uh, fibrosis can occur. so that itself uh, decreases the effective uh, the contractility of the heart and that also causes a low cardiac output and also the valvular condition changes there is thickening age related thickening and sclerosis of the valves uh, especially aortic stream if uh, there is aortic valve is calcified it uh, hampers the uh, uh, it increases hampers the cardiac output then uh, cardiac also the alteration in the the hypertrophy and uh, the fibrosis of the myocardium itself can uh, damage the a conduction system and my patient would be at increased risk of uh, arrhythmias at this age so the load sorry sir what about the afterload the afterload increases because uh, there is increase in the uh, systemic vascular resistance at this age so vessels are stiff and, and also there uh, there is uh, myocardial thickening and hypertrophy leading to stiffening and uh, hypertrophy of the ventricle that makes the ventricle less compliant and uh, so uh, he'll have uh, diastole uh, diastolic dysfunction is common in elderly okay and there is this is the diastolic dysfunction you said there is systolic dysfunction which is more common at this age group diastolic dysfunction is more why so you're right but why so because uh, the pro, uh, the heart age related this uh, the occurrence of this myocardial interstitial fibrosis is more common here unless there is a uh, coexisting um, other uh, disease that uh, diastolic dysfunction remains more common because structural changes in the heart are more severe than the vascular changes at this okay. age all right so anything else that you have in uh, the cardiovascular system and also my patient the compensatory responses to any physiological stress would be reduced so yeah. the maximal heart rate of my patient would be reduced so even if my patient develops hypotension due to any cause uh the compensatory tachycardia would be reduced and also the response to any of the sympathomimetic drugs would also be reduced so what my happens, patient now what happens to the conduction uh the hypertrophy as well as the myocardial uh, cell the myocyte that due to the age both of them they cause disarray of the conduction fibers so my patient would be more prone to arrhythmias at this age uh yeah, it as well as there will be slight delay in conduction conduction will be relatively slow as compared to someone who is uh, you know at a younger age group because uh, the cells there in the ac node also decrease in number so that's why uh, the conduction also is affected yes, okay and also then uh, my patient uh, since uh, he is in a low cardiac output state then my patient would be more dependent on preload for uh, forward ejection because in case he requires both a normal sinus rhythm without any tachycardia and also he needs an adequate fluid volume in the absence of these two he is very prone for hypotension okay hold on there so now let's go to the respiration since the time is up 
So okay. let's move on to the respiratory system. Ma'am, please feel free to come in any time. Madam Leonard, please yes, sir. To come in any time. Yes, sir. You can continue. Let them continue, sir. I've just okay, said, fine. You may not feel so. Okay. Yes, okay. Uh, ladies, please carry on. Respiratory system, sir. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Uh, coming to the uh, respiratory system, with age, there is a weakening of all the muscles, including the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. So the strength of the respiratory, so that would be reduced in the, in my patient, especially. Then also there's age-related calcification of the costochondral joints. The arthritic changes are there. So the chest fold as such is very stiff. So the compliance of the chest fold would be very much reduced. And age-related degradation of the... Um, protein uh, in the uh, of the lung so there would be emphysematous changes age wise and also my patient being an uh, who being an ex smoker he would have already had those emphysematous changes so the emphysematous changes are there and also uh, uh, by the age of 66 itself the frc uh, the closing capacity becomes equal to the frc even in the standing position so my patient being 80 years of age he would have increased uh, uh, the the basal. There would be increased basal epilepsy. So that itself increases the uh, chances of hypoxemia due to shunting and the closure of this basal small alveoli. Then um, also, my patient would be more prone to uh, post op uh, to post op uh, perioperative pneumonia because age related there is decrease in the uh, par uh, pharyngeal muscle tone. Then there is also decreased uh, effectiveness of the cough. Then the mucociliary clearance would be reduced. Uh, then there is esophageal hypomotility, and all these they uh, make my they would it would make my patient more prone to aspiration. Mm -hmm. So post-op uh, pneumonia is also a possibility in my patient. What happens to the ciliary activity? Ciliary activity is reduced, and especially since he's a uh, he was a smoker, there would have also been that air damage. So this is one factor which is very important in the post-operative period because. If the ciliary activity is less and he is not able to cough effectively, so that's quite often the reason for retention of secretions, which further get infected and, you know, patient ends up with pneumonia. Also, in case there is prolonged uh, lying down or immobilization of the patient, uh, patient is lying in the bed, so there is likely to be some sort of hypostatic congestion also in these patients, which will add to the development of pneumonia. Uh, Further on, you see, uh, these patients at this age, they often have some degree of uh, kyphosis as well. You know, the spine, uh, due to the uh, osteoarthritic changes, uh, osteoporosis rather, the spine sometimes get some degree of kyphosis. So that uh, becomes uh, addition to uh, uh, the respiratory impairment because of adding the restrictive uh, factor to it. So apart from not only the constrictive, there is some sort of restrictive disorder. I don't mean that every patient would have it, but this is something that uh, is quite often seen in this area. All right. The cough reflex you already said is uh, quite often blunted, and these patients are more likely to get post-operative uh, chest infection. Right. Can, uh, what can you do to uh, ensure that the chest infection in the post-operative period is reduced as much as possible? Uh, first thing. Uh, if I'm uh, one thing is uh, I would avoid over sedation, especially any drug that I give, especially in case of opioids, I would give them in a titrated doses so that he does not have any respiratory depression okay. and uh, that he's not overly sedated. Then second thing, in case I'm going for a general anesthesia uh, mode, then I would always uh, I would avoid intermediate and long-acting neuromuscular blockages, and I would reverse my patient after the procedure only after. Adequate, uh, I would extubate my patient only after adequate reversal has been ensured. Then, uh, prior to the procedure, uh, I would uh, possibly give an antacid to neutralize the uh, acidity of whatever gastric contents are available. So that in case he does aspirate, uh, the acidity of those contents would be reduced and the chemical immunities associated would be reduced. Right. Uh, these patients uh, are more likely to have some sort of uh, uh, area of traction in the post-operative period, particularly, uh, you know, not frank area of traction, but snoring and the possibility of uh, sleep apnea is also more common. Why is it so? Because with, um, so because the pharyngeal muscle tone will be lost with advanced age. Quite right. Uh, uh, then uh, esophageal motility is decreased. So a gastric contents can't be uh, like uh, forwarded to the stomach. So there is increased uh, risk of aspiration in elderly patients. 
then not only that i mean uh, see, Neo, uh, when you said uh, neoglossus muscle tone is also lost so there is a uh, uh, chance for the tongue obstructing by the uh, by the patient is so fine the tongue uh, coming back on the posterior pharyngeal wall so that is happening and uh, the possibility of aspiration as you were saying uh, in the post period period is also high the reason being you said uh, decreased peristalsis you were saying something uh so and also they have got a basically reduced uh, respiratory uh, the response to hypoxia would be reduced so that is also no with regard to aspiration uh, post operative in the post operative period aspiration the tone in the low esophageal sphincter mm -hmm. is decreased okay so there is more possibility of the gastric contents coming into the oropharynx and the patient can have aspiration so that may be one of the reason that in the post operative period uh, these patients can have a problem okay carry on uh, what else in uh, uh, respiratory is done so let's come to uh, some of the system which one would you like to uh, carry on so let's say uh, start with uh, gi system you have already said about the pharyngeal muscles you have already said about the peristalsis what happens to the peristalsis or esophagus that is the hypomobility is there it hi uh, there is the peristalsis would be reduced hypomobility right. yes yes so there is hypomotility patient might feel some sort of a, uh, you know dysphagia also uh, may complain like that but it's not dysphagia frankly it's basically because of the reduced peristaltic uh, activity of the esophagus okay anything else you would like to uh, say about the gi system yes, sir. Uh, hepatic. hepatic blood flow is also reduced with age so drugs so any drug that i uh, give uh, drugs that are dependent on the hepatic they have got a high hepatic extraction those drugs the elimination would be reduced and they would have a prolonged duration of action mm -hmm. and uh, the liver the hepatic reserve is also reduced there it can be the liver can easily develop ischemic changes with any uh, change in the any physiological stress then uh, also coming to the drug metabolism the phase 1 uh, metabolism the drug is also reduced these patients are also likely to have uh, some degree of uh, gastritis also chronic gastritis you don't forget the, uh, that these patients are uh, having you know some joint pains so they are having some sort of analgesics for a long period of time so these patients are likely to have gastritis and in the post operative period there may be some possibility of uh, stress ulceration as well or the gastric distension uh, these patients might uh, complain of so uh, that's again uh, not uh, something that cannot be overlooked yes go on ma'am please feel free to come any time okay sir ma'am please uh. and then um, the, drug, the drug metabolism the phase 1 metabolism of the drugs that would be reduced the phase 1 activity is reduced uh, but the phase 2 is relatively unaltered then uh, the increased risk of aspiration is already mentioned and then uh, what about the kidneys anything happens to the kidneys yes sir with age the cortical atrophy uh, the normal uh, kidney in normal adult which weighs around 250 grams by the with a, a beer the cortical atrophy occurs and uh, in elderly it comes to around only 180 grams with relative uh, loss of the cortical nephrons Due to and then also due to glomerular sclerosis. Then uh, GFR falls by around uh, one milliliter per uh, kilogram per meter square uh, every year after the age of fifty years. Uh, then um, yeah. number of glomeruli uh, decrease. Sir, number of glomeruli also decrease. Number of glomeruli decrease, yeah. and since the lean body mass is very less in elderly patients, uh, the creatinine levels will be lower yeah. than normal. Uh, mm -hmm. so uh, lo lower creatinine levels can even obscure an underlying uh, chronic uh, kidney disease uh, then uh, they are uh, more prone to urinary tract infections uh, and urological infections uh, in females uh, postmenopausal females because of the atrophy of vagina and breakdown of skin uh, ascending infections are very common and they this predisposes to uti in females uh, in males uh, male elderly patients can have uh, enlarged prostates with, which leads to stasis of urine inside the bladder again predisposing them to urinary tract infections what about the capacity to uh, you know uh, conserve sodium is it maintained decreases oh, sir this dysnatremias are very common in the elderly age um, uh, they are more for, prone for developing hyponatremia yeah. uh, then um, it's not very uncommon very uh, commonly seen in the post operative period or even before also 
Okay. Okay, sir. What about thermoregulation and uh, old age? Uh, Ma'am, uh, th uh, the uh, so, uh, e even if there is total like total body fat increases in the elderly, but subcutaneous fat loss is uh, very much pronounced. And uh, uh, subcutaneous fat is what insulates the body against hypothermia. And also, uh, due to the changes in uh, cutaneous microcirculation, elderly people are uh, very prone to developing hypothermia. And, and in this patient, and in and this patient, this hypothermia is detrimental because it can uh, increase the uh, like uh, postoperative shivering can all increase the myocardial oxygen demand which is detrimental in a patient with ischemic heart disease. Okay. okay, sir. What about the bladder? Anything happens to the bladder in these patients? Uh, yeah. Okay. Anything the muscle uh, oh, weakness on. is there. Uh, hmm? weakness can the trusor muscle weakness can occur. There can be, and also yeah. due to the enlargement of the prostate, the bladder, uh, weakness of the bladder and retention of the urine can occur. The bladder capacity decreases. Okay, that may be one of the reasons that patients have to go to the washroom very frequently. Okay, there may be other reasons, of course. There can be other reasons. There is no denying that. But uh, uh, this this is one reason that uh, can uh, happen. Okay, carry on. Then uh, coming to yeah. the musculoskeletal. Uh, go ahead with musculoskeletal system, sir. Any other system that you are uh, that you would like to uh, go to? Musculoskeletal system. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, there is decrease in both the muscle mass as well as the muscle strength with age. Mm -hmm. uh, muscle mass decreases by around one percent per year after the age of uh, thirty, but the muscle uh, strength decreases by three percent, which is higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, also there are arthritic changes and uh, the loss of the subcutaneous uh, fat. Also, all these make my uh, would. Uh, the arthritic changes would make a, the difficulty in positioning and mm. they're more prone to injury. So they would have to be carefully padded all pressure points and uh, the loss of the subcutaneous fat itself makes the nerves more prone to pressure injuries. So okay. careful padding is required. Mm. Uh, then uh, musculoskeletal system. But uh, the osteoporosis is also there at this age. So that, mm. makes, uh, that would make my patient more prone to fractures. Okay. Okay. What about the integumentary system? Sorry, sir. Integumentary skin and other things. Skin. Uh, there is a high incidence of uh, also skin drying and uh, skin is easily fragile. It would collagen. easy uh, collagen is reduced, yes. so easy bruisability. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the subcutaneous fat is less. Yes. Cutaneous uh, circulation is also impaired, so making them more prone to hypothermia, sir. Cutaneous and also wound healing would be impaired. Okay. Anything else? Mm. See, these patients are more prone to bed sores as well. Yes, oh, yes sir. sir. There is uh, loss of uh, subcutaneous fat and everything. They have no cushioning effect. Uh, you know, the weight uh, bearing is. Uh, directly from the bone onto the uh, you know bed so uh, there is uh, ischemia of the skin which is more easily that occurs and uh, these patients are more likely to get uh, you know uh, the bed source as well so what's important how will you prevent that of course it's very uh, simple i mean you would say that just turn around the patient every two hours put a mat water mattress put uh, air uh, mattress whatever so that the pressure is equally distributed uh, you know, uh, to all parts of the body. What about IV access? Yeah, important question. Intravenous access would also be difficult in, uh, uh, they would have fragile blood vessels, so... Uh, Not only fragile, the okay. skin, because of lack, uh, absence of subcutaneous fat, you find it difficult to cannulate the, any existing veins. Yes. Okay. So the, the skin will slip as you try to cannulate. Okay. Fine. Mm. Continue. Yes, go on. Uh, uh, but anything else that uh, uh, can bother you uh, with regard to induction of NRCI in these patients because of the loss of subcutaneous tissue as well as, uh, you know, uh, thin skin? Fat content is reduced. So... Yes. Uh, the lipophilic drugs, 
No. IV cannulation may be difficult sometimes. Okay, the veins are not supported by the fat around. So, you know, the moment you try to touch the needle, it moves around and in the, in, in eventually you end up uh, making multiple punctures uh, to the side. So, IV access may sometimes be difficult because the veins, it's difficult to stabilize the vein. Uh, if, you, if you're an experienced person, uh, certainly you can do that. Uh, but it may be a little difficult uh, sometimes in the hands of particularly the newer uh, ones. Yes, go on. Then coming to the hematological system, my uh, the patient would be with age. There is uh, the bone marrow tissue, the bone marrow. There would be atrophy, so there would be reduced erythropoiesis. And the, my patient would be more prone to anemia. Also, on top of it, uh, the, the intake might be reduced. So uh, okay. nutritional anemia can also occur. Then uh, there is also due to the loss of bone marrow tissue, they, uh, my patient will be more prone to leukopenia, uh, so making him more prone to infections in the post-operative period as well, which is also detrimental. Then, uh, I think in GI system, uh, missed out on something. The motility of the intestines also goes down. So that may be one of the factors that these patients are likely to uh, have uh, constipation particularly in the post-operative period because uh, uh, there may be fecal infection uh, in case a uh, patient is not given some sort of uh, uh, laxative or some drugs to uh, evacuate the bowel. So they can end up with uh, fecal infection if he's uh, on bed for a long period of time in the post-operative, not, not for hernia, but yes, uh, that, that is something that needs to be looked into. Okay, uh, anything else that you would like to say? This patient is edentulous. What is the implication to you as anesthetist? Very true. Uh, madam and Eden, Hello. Madam and edentulous patient uh, is considered to, uh, we, we would be, uh, it would be able to, I mean, uh, difficult to uh, establish bag and mask ventilation for an edentulous patient because of the hollowing of cheeks and soft tissue. And loss of buccal fat. Buccal fat. Buccal fat. What are you going to do with it? The madam is going to ask the next question. <laughs> <laughs> you have to deal with it. You have to How do you overcome that? <laughs> That's what sir wants to know. Uh, uh, we apply cushioning material uh, like uh, to make the seal, to yes. ensure a proper seal, we would uh, keep a uh, some cushioning material like a pad in between the uh, mask and the patient's face okay anything else see what see, just just think why is intubation difficult in these patients in a normal patient who has dentition so you can open the mouth with the lingoscope and that's good enough because there are teeth and then there is a large oral cavity whereas in these patients since there are no teeth so the oral cavity is not as large as you have in a normal person who has dentition. Okay, there is one the, the one Indian uh, gentleman, uh, a very respected anesthesiologist, who has devised or who has made some change in the in the lingoscope blade. Do you know of that? No. There is one man, Dr. Doshi. What he has done is he has increased the uh, you know the flange part of it that becomes it wider. So that helps to open the alveoli, I mean, no, not the alveoli, the gums uh, far apart so that you have more space available there. And uh, that, that uh, does it all. I mean, that helps you to intubate that patient more uh, easily. What else makes difficult intubation in these patients? So the falling, falling back of tongue due to uh, hypotonia of uh, yeah. hypoparyngeal muscles and the genioglosis, it can yeah. obstruct Opposition. the upper airway. Yes. Anything else, that is obstructing the airway. I'm mm -hmm. saying obstructing the airway. Yes, position. Position. Due to the arthritic to changes of the joints, it would be difficult for them uh, to place my position in the uh, what changes in the air position. What changes in the jaw? Arthritic changes, so it would be arthritic. difficult to est uh, and extend his neck. and. Are the arthritic changes in the jaw more serious a concern uh, at the time of intubation of such patients or some other changes? Both arthritic changes of the jaw. Jaw is also uh, significant because the mouth opening would be restricted. Then the spine. 
a spinal so it would be difficult to position next that's more difficult you see uh, that's more likely to happen okay because of the arthritic changes sometimes these uh, patients have there is slight increase in the curvature at the sarcoidal junction so you may need to keep a high pillow because they have sometimes they have a hunched back so the positioning may be somewhat difficult then extension may not be as good as you can have in a person who is say 20 years old okay so all these things uh, make uh, you know uh, tongue falling back makes your bag mask ventilation difficult arthritic changes or uh, because of uh, the spine changes it is a positioning may be may be difficult so there are a combination of factors which uh, as madam was asking uh, can make your intubation difficult in these patients all right okay yes. anything else that you would like to say about these patients then uh, on the whole my anesthetic concern uh, one was as we have dealt so far about the geriatric age the second one is my patient being uh, uh, having a history of ischemic heart disease managing uh, the perioperative period it would be uh, it it my goal would be to maintain the myocardial oxygen supply demand balance because anything which increases the myocardial oxygen demand or reduces the myocardial oxygen supply both of these could uh, cause a further uh, ischemic heart uh, further fresh myocardial infarction so that would also be my main concern, one of my main goals then uh, also my patient is a hypertensive so the, the he would have exaggerated response to any of the drugs so that is also another concern and uh, also since ischemic heart disease along with he is a post pl uh, stent placement patient so there is a risk of stent uh, thrombosis and bleeding due to the antiplatelets but since he has already covered around uh, covered a period of around 10 years after the stent placement the risk of thrombosis would be reduced but since he is continuing uh, antiplatelets ecosprin he is at increased risk of bleeding due to uh, during the procedure okay so, so these are my main concerns you said that these are your concerns i appreciate your concerns very valid and very uh, uh, genuine now how are you going to meet your concerns yes sir that one, uh, so first uh, since my planned mode of anesthesia is uh, uh, central neuraxial block with okay. uh, so you want to come to that all right no, so your choice of anesthesia is central neuraxial block yes. all right okay. what technique uh, epidural uh, so central neuraxial block is, uh, with graded epidural anesthesia okay. uh, with uh, epidural insertion at l1 l2 intervertebral space uh, to achieve a dermatomal block up to uh, t10 level so the, you can achieve that level only at l1 l2 level no sir uh, sir my uh, being an elderly patient uh, his spine can have arthritic changes and it would be difficult a thoracic epidural can be uh, uh, technically difficult you don't get thoracic epidural for uh, a patient who is trying to go hernia surgery do you no sir no. Now uh, listen, note that don't mention thoracic epidural. They are not going to catch you there, so <laughs> please don't uh, do that. You have been doing very well. I am sincerely, uh, you know, I sincerely appreciate that, but don't go into thoracic epidural. Don't ever mention it. Now I I pose a slight difficulty for you. Uh, tolerate me for some time. Uh, this is a patient you examined the back, mm -hmm. and uh, you feel that the spine is almost fused. It, it can happen. Mm -hmm. Now what are you going? What what comes to your mind? is it going to be an easy epidural is it going to be difficult epidural if it's going to be difficult epidural what are you going to do about that so it could be a difficult epidural uh, especially through the midline approach so okay. we can uh, go for a paramedian approach for uh, approaching the epidural space why is it difficult uh, in the midline approach uh, so the calcification of uh, ligaments uh, interspinous and supraspinous ligaments can occur at this stage so what it might be difficult to sir what about ligament of flavor Yeah. ligament of flavum will also be uh, calcified so it might be difficult to uh, hold, on. hold on lady ligament of flavum is the only ligament that does not calcify don't make this mistake of saying it to the examiner that this will calcify and can you tell me the reason i'll give you one mark extra the yellow elastic ligament with no absolutely it's because of yellow elastic fibers and there are few other uh, joint ligaments also which i am not going to bring in at this time because of the shortage of time so this is the only ligament that doesn't calcify the supraspinous and interspinous calcify that's very right it's a good answer now let's say that you know you you found the spine which is uh, almost fused you hardly feel the interspinous space what are you going to do now 
first uh, i would uh, i would try a paramedian approach for epidural needle insertion all right if not possible uh, i could go for an uh, i would use okay. ultrasound guided epidural needle placement okay hold on there uh, now i think it's a very simple question uh, but this is asked every time uh, there is a mention of uh, regional uh, anesthesia or or for epidural or for spinal anesthesia what are the structure that you pierce as you go from skin to the say subarachnoid space of the epidural i, I know you are laughing that uh, it's a so simple a question ye to sara me you know the we know it by heart right go ahead uh so skin first i would pierce the skin then the subcutaneous tissue mm -hmm. and then supraspinous ligament then sure. the interspinous ligament yes. uh then the uh, uh ligament and flavum yeah but you don't need to think you have done 100 times more than many 100 times okay then what do you pierce the ligament of flavum what comes next we enter the epidural space sir quite right in case you have to go to the subarachnoid space then what uh, i have to pierce the dura yes and the arachnoid uh, arachnoid mat of the yes then you will go there all and right and then we we'll enter the intrathecal space this is with regard to the midline approach Yes. Right? yes sir now the, as i told you that uh, these ligaments are calcified supraspinous and interspinous are calcified what are you going to do now so paramedian approach i would try go for a paramedian approach uh, where okay. i can what are the yeah. structures that you pierce now uh, so skin subcutaneous tissue i can actually bypass the supraspinous and the interspinous ligament can you, you will bypass anyway you can't uh -huh. it's not the question of you can or you may you perhaps you probably no you will bypass that's the whole purpose of paramedian approach huh? okay then what next uh, paraspinal muscles good this is something that most of the students uh, miss out because they say that skin sir subcutaneous tissue sir ligament of flavum you know there is a <laughs> gap between the ligament of flavum so i i asked you first okay forget about this now you know that all right anything else uh, that you would say about uh, what about the drug will the dose of drug be same or it is going to be less or it is going to be more and the dose of the drug required to achieve even the similar block would be less as compared to a younger individual because okay. one uh, one the elderly their nerve roots are more prone uh, they more sensitive to local okay. anesthetics second the epidural space would be narrow it run there is loss of uh, areolar adipose tissue in the epidural space with age and also there is a stenosis of the uh, intervertebral foramen uh, the neural foramen so the exit of the drugs through laterally through the foramen would be reduced and with the same dose of drug a higher septal spread can be would be achieved and uh, since you are putting in a catheter i believe you are putting in a catheter is it right yes, sir. right yes, sir. so how much catheter would you keep inside the space inside the space epidural space 5 cm sir okay by 5 your answer is right i appreciate 5 cm because right. one is if if it is less than 5 cm with the repositioning making the patient supine there is a risk of catheter dislodgement and any further threading uh, there is the risk of unilateral block or patchy block so that is why i would like patchy block sorry sir why patch, patchy block like uh, there is a chance of catheter migration one intra both out, uh, out of the neural canal it might go through one of the intervertebral spaces and it might go out so you may not have a block which is bilaterally equal all right yes okay all right anything else uh, with regard to the regional anesthesia uh, regional anesthesia one uh, even uh, advantage is it sir okay all right uh, uh, sir an epidural anesthesia will blunt the sympathetic uh, response uh, of increased heart rate and uh, hypertension in this patient because those things uh, ha, ha, increase tachycardia and hypertension can uh, increase the myocardial oxygen supply uh, increase mm. the oxygen demand of the myocardium and mm. there therefore be detrimental to this patient with ischemic heart disease another okay. one is uh, analgesia of a superior with epidural uh, anesthesia and it can also be extended to the post operative period where again uh, all these effects can uh, worsen his uh, cardiac status a pain tachycardia and all so we would like to extend analgesia to the post operative period to reduce the morbidity and mortality of the patient mm. yeah. all right post op ids would be reduced sir mm. early ambulation is possible uh, if we provide superior analgesia elderly patients are at uh, more risk for developing thrombo dvt and thromboembolism and all 
So such events can be uh, reduced if we put a uh, epidural analysis. Yeah. Get these patients out of the bed as early as possible, because uh, you know sooner they are out of bed and they are mobile, their possibility of DVT uh, goes down. Okay. All right. What other uh, precautions or uh, that you will have? Uh, in, Madam, please feel free to come. Please come in. Madam, please can join me. Yes, ma'am. Please carry on. This patient uh, is on uh, antiplatelet, no? Yeah. Yes. Supposing the patient was on dual antiplatelet, can you comment on that? Uh, and with regards to your anticoagulant uh, effects, with regards to your uh, epidural or central neuroaxial blockage. So, uh, if my patient would have been on dual antiplatelet, that increases the risk of um, uh, bleeding. Especially if I'm proceeding with a you know, central neuroaxial blocker, there would be the risk of spinal hematoma. So, I would always consider the risk of uh, whether the risk of bleeding or the risk due to stopping the antiplatelet, the risk of thrombosis would be higher. And uh, in my patient, what's the risk of stopping a dual antiplatelet therapy? What's the risk? Uh, stopping a new land, there is a risk of uh, one is stent thrombosis. Okay. So that's the most important thing. thing. So when you stop your uh, clopidogrel, especially, that is one important factor which predisposes to the development, especially if it is stopped prematurely when you have a uh, drug eluting stent. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to weigh the risk of stent thrombosis along with the risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. So if the bleeding is manageable, then uh, we can uh, take up the patient with your antiplatelet. But in certain surgeries, there is a definite risk of bleeding, which is over and above the risk of stent thrombosis, which are those cases in which you'll have to definitely stop your antiplatelet therapy before you take them up for surgery. Madam, in high-risk surgeries like neurosurgeries, uh, spinal cord decompression, then in intraocular okay. surgeries, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair surgeries, uh, we'll definitely have to stop uh, uh, antiplatelet therapy. Prostate. And also in prostatic demi. Prostatic. Okay. So in those kind of surgeries, you'll definitely have to stop your antiplatelet because the risk of bleeding into closed spaces or the risk of bleeding is higher when compared to your stent thrombosis. Okay. So when the patient comes with a PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, what are the things you should see in your pre-operative assessment? Um, for a patient with a PCA uh, or a stent in situ, first thing is uh, we have to ensure whether the whether a stent is there or he was he only underwent a balloon angioplasty. Second thing is the interval between the PCA uh, procedure and the uh, timing of the surgery, current surgery. Uh, then uh, and then the uh, whether he has been uh, receiving uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for enough duration uh, that depends on the type of stent which is inside. Uh, what are the types of stents? Coronary stents. Uh, Intracoronary stents could be either bare metal stents or drug eluting stents. Uh, uh, balloon angioplasty had a risk of uh, early arterial vessel closure leading to uh, repeat MI. So. Uh, Bare metal stents were introduced. Bare metal stents, uh, they had larger struts, so they could cause endothelial injury and again uh, lead to the risk of uh, thrombosis. Uh, so, uh, and also there was a chance of, uh, there was increased chance, risk of uh, neointimal hyperplasia leading to stent re stenosis. So, to, in order to com uh, combat this, uh, drug eluting stents uh, came into place. Uh, drugs like uh, stents used to be coated with uh, durable polymer coating with drugs like uh, serolimus, evrolimus or soterolimus came into place. Uh, the problem with uh, these uh, drug eluting stents is that they take longer time for re-endothelialization. So for a prolonged period, the patient will be prone to uh, stent thrombosis. Uh, that is with drug eluting stent, we have to continue dual antiplatelet therapy for at least one year after the stent insertion. Okay, sir. Over to you, sir. This is uh, this patient is on certain drugs. Uh, I think uh, one is the antihypertensive. Uh, okay, can you name the drugs uh, uh, that this patient is on? Metoprolol 50 milligram OD, Ecosystem okay. 75 milligram OD. Uh, okay. uh, antihypertensive, sir. Okay, and uh, enalapril uh, 2.5 milligram twice daily, sir. Okay. What are the drugs that you would like to discontinue before surgery and what you can continue for surgery? Say uh, hernia. 
and then we'll think of uh, uh, surgery which is uh, more than hernia uh, so this is a hernia surgery which is a superficial surgery so it's a low risk surgery we don't we do not expect much of a bleeding uh, so since our patient has already completed the period of dual antiplatelet therapy and he he is like 10 years after the pca and he is only on ecosprin uh, aspirin monotherapy so aspirin monotherapy uh, it is okay to continue during the perioperative period because we do not uh, expect much bleeding in our patient uh, then uh, beta blockers should be continued perioperatively because they have good anti hypertensive anti ischemic and they also decrease the myocardial contractility in, uh, decrease the heart rate thereby increasing the coronary uh, perfusion and they also have a myocardial cell membrane uh, stabilizing effect and also platelet aggregation also is inhibited by beta blockers so beta blockers it is always uh, good to continue in the perioperative period uh, then enalapril is an ace inhibitor angiotensin con converting enzyme inhibitor uh, it is uh, better we stop enalapril uh, 24 hours uh, prior to surgery because the patient can go into refractory hypotension following induction of anesthesia if he is not discontinued uh, enalapril there are certain drugs which uh, see uh, antiplatelets and uh, uh, anticoagulants there are certain guidelines with regard to uh, institution of regional anesthesia say epidural uh, putting in an epidural line so can you uh, enumerate those guidelines with regard to uh, placement of epidural not necessarily in this patient uh, regarding antiplatelets if it if my patient was on clopidogrel i would ask the patient before the needle insertion before the needle insertion to be stopped uh, seven uh, seven days prior to needle insertion and uh, the removal of the uh, epidural catheter can be done uh, soon after if you no know, uh, the duct can be restarted soon after epidural catheter removal in case of uh, ticlopidy the drug would have to be stopped 10 days prior to the epidural Uh, needle insertion or the catheter placement and uh, restarting can be done soon after the epidural catheter removal in case of um, prasugrel the drug would have to be stopped prasugrel would have to be stopped uh, right. 7 to 7 to 10 days uh, prior to epidural needle insertion and the restarting would have uh, restarting after the catheter removal should be there should be a gap of around 6 hours and then um, uh tiro uh, tiro fiban in that case we have to stop for at least 5 uh, days and uh, a 6 hours gap before restarting after the epidural catheter removal and coming to anticoagulants sir or? yes okay now uh, coming to unfractionated heparin uh, we can 6 uh, hours after the stopping of a and then okay 6 uh, hours after the stopping of the therapeutic dose it is safe to insert a uh central neuraxial catheter and one hour after the uh, insertion of the catheter we can uh, we can restart mm -hmm. then uh, coming to low molecular weight heparin depends on whether the patient would be on a therapeutic dose or prophylactic dose if my patient would, would uh, is on a therapeutic dose i would give a 24 hours gap between the last dose and uh, the needle insertion and uh, a four hours gap after the uh, catheter removal Till restarting for restarting the low molecular weight postoperatively, and if my patient would uh, would have been on a prophylactic dose, I would give twelve hours gap between the last dose and the epidural catheter insertion, and four hours gap after the catheter removal, I can restart the low molecular weight at the at the prophylactic dose. Okay, uh, uh, this patient, uh, let's say I'm making things difficult for you uh, for the. uh let's say this patient has had a bed sore in that region mm. right and uh, you are not very comfortable uh, going ahead with regional anesthesia mm. or patient just doesn't give you consent for regional anesthesia either option you take it i don't mind my point is that you have to give general anesthesia to this patient what are you going to do now start right from your preoperative visit to the post operative uh, uh, with the post -op operative admission to the recovery please go ahead Okay, so in that case, I would plan for uh, general anesthesia with controlled ventilation oh, with a cuffed oh, oral endotracheal tube mm -hmm. uh, for this patient. Mm -hmm. uh, on uh, on the preoperative day, I would visit the patient uh, and I would uh, introduce myself and uh, tell the patient what uh, what is the procedure I am planning to do. 
uh, i would uh, give him a, a note on uh, the fasting guidelines he has to follow before surgery uh, before that i would take an informed uh, consent from the patient and, and a reliable bystander then i would uh, tell him the fasting guidelines uh, which is 6 hours for solid and uh, he can take uh, clear fluid still uh, two hours before the uh, planned procedure uh, this is important because uh, any uh, decrease in intravascular volume can be detrimental in this patient following induction if he goes into hypotension uh, that can cause sorry sir? sir unlimited amount of fluid no, no sir, sir. Uh, while while fasting he can uh, continue to take clear fluids until two hours before surgery okay I was just asking the volume. Can you allow him unlimited fluid? He has a jug full of water. Two two as before. Yes, sir. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, to alleviate his anxiety, I would also counsel him. Uh, plus, I can give a short-acting benz, sir. Yeah, what kind of anxiety? Uh, sir, anxiety I can give a short-acting benzodiazepine, uh, like alprazolam, point two five milligram, on the uh, night before surgery, which could alleviate his anxiety. Uh, okay. Then I would also give a, a prokinetic and a proton pump inhibitor to him, uh, uh, preferably pantoprazole, forty milligram at night, as well as on the morning of surgery. Uh, so then I would ask him to uh, discount. Uh, apart from what you do with regard to the drugs that you use on this patient, what's important is uh, very patient listening, reassuring to the patient and giving some sort of counseling. That will work better than your anxiety or something. Because if he understands that, you know, if he understands that you are a competent person, that will happen only in case you listen to his story. These patients quite often are hard of hearing they they have poor vision so you have to have you have to be patient while you are dealing with these uh, people one plus uh, these patients sometimes are psychologically low yeah. one they know that on the wrong side of age secondly they i am not saying every patient but most of these patients are kind of uh, not well cared and uh, the family support is not as much as you have uh, you may see in, in a young patient. So there may be some psychological disorders also in these patients. They may be somewhat depressed. They may be uh, you know they may not be able to communicate properly. They they would be quite low. So it's important that you talk to those patients patiently, listen to them, and reassure that everything will be okay. okay. All right. So drugs are important, all right. But more than the drugs, I think it's the time that you spend with these patients. All right, carry on. So, patient has now come to the uh, come to the uh, to the recovery, uh, to, not to the recovery, to the OT. Mm -hmm. Consent checked, machine checked, drugs checked, prepared, mm -hmm. and uh, everything is there. Uh, go ahead now. Uh, drugs OT. I would keep the OT warm. OT warm. Good. Very nice. Fine. How much warm? <laughs> Surgeon will jump from you. <laughs> <laughs> so, better you will keep OT warm, all right, as long as the surgeon is comfortable. Otherwise, he will make, uh, you know, he'll be throwing tantrums. Either you keep the OT warm or you keep the patient warm. I mean, the patient should be warm. As Madam earlier asked you, uh, you know, these patients uh, are likely to uh, be hypothermic, okay, uh, after surgery. So, they are more prone to hypothermia. So, you will, in case the surgeon wants, uh, you know, the temperature to be cool or it's, it's extreme of uh, summer season. You would like to have the temperature low. So be, assure, be sure that you warm up the patient very well. It's not that uh, the patient also gets cold. That, that's going to be difficult. All right. So it, it's a good point. I, I note that. That's nice. You are taking care of the patient's temperature. What else? Then uh, also I would, uh, um, after checking, um, keep the drugs ready. I would keep drugs the... Ready, consent is ready, table is ready, machine checked, everything done. Move on. Okay. On the day of the surgery, I would, uh, in the pre-operative room, I would visit my patient. I would again reintroduce myself. I would reassure him. Mm -hmm. I would again counsel him to allay any anxiety if he has. Then mm -hmm. uh, I would ensure that he has taken his uh, morning dose of uh, metoprolol. And I would also ensure that he has had a 24 hours gap since his last uh, enlargable dose. Then I would uh, the, the antiplatelet. Uh, 
Uh, I would also ensure his uh, in whether he has passed it uh, for at least there's at least a two hours of gap since his last fluid intake, clear fluid intake, and that he's been fasting from solid foods for at least six hours. Then I would ensure that he's had uh, his morning dose of pantoprazole as well. Then uh, uh, under local, uh, then I would recheck the consent uh, whether it has been signed, the informed consent both by the patient and the bystander. Then uh, I would uh, uh, recheck whether the blood and plate of concentrate have been arranged in the blood bank. Then uh, I would, under local anesthesia, Is I would take the patient for hernia repair. Yes, sir. Since uh, it was uh, sorry, yes, sir. Do you need DNA uh, blood uh, for these patients? Uh, no, sir. Not you don't need three, sir. You don't need that. Okay. Right. For a hernia surgery, which is uh, simple, maybe an R surgery, you know, a good surgeon might finish in 45 minutes even. Or, uh, of course, sometimes people can take one and a half hours. That's a different story. But uh, I don't think you need uh, blood for, the, uh, for this patient. Right. So since you are saying everything, I'll check, I'll check this, I'll check that, I'll check consent, everything. That's one thing else that you would do. Uh... Need a hint? IV candle. What? Anemia. Anemia. No, not, not anemia. Yes, you know, I... with regard to the documents. Document. Consent. Consent is that, that you said it already. Patient identification. Identification. Surgical safety checklist also. You I... have to take all those uh, columns before you proceed to uh, induction of anesthesia. The first sign in that has to be checked. You and in that also, and that comes blood required or not required. You know the imaging displayed or not displayed. Patient has some allergy uh, or not. Uh, you know things like that. So not only that you check consent, you also check or tick on the uh, surgical safety checklist also. This just came to my mind because you were saying, sir, I'll check consent. I'll. I said everything done. Please move on. You still got stuck to the document. Okay, go on. All done. Then, under local anesthesia, I would secure an 18 gauge IV candle in his non dominant hand, left hand in my patient. Mm -hmm. Then, in the preoperative room, I, uh, I would start an IV fluid. I would start normal saline at 100 ml per hour by the IV candle. Mm -hmm. Then, I would also administer midazolam uh, 0.5 milligram intravenously along with uh, ondansetran 4 milligram uh, intravenously. And uh, since I'm planning for general anesthesia, I also glycopyrrole uh, 0.2 milligram uh, intravenously. Then uh, again, uh, then I would sh shift my patient to the operating. I would uh, wheel my wheel my patient into the operating room, and uh, before uh, after ensuring adequate assistance, I would gently shift my patient to the operating table. I would again reassure him, uh, then allay any anxiety if he has. Then I uh, after then uh, I would pre-oxygenate. Go on, go on, go on quickly. Then uh, I would pre-oxygenate my patient. Uh, then after shifting my patient to the operation table, I would attach some monitors. I would attach a non-invasive blood pressure, a pulse oximeter, and a three lead ECG in my patient, especially since he is a case of ischemic heart disease post stent placement. Then uh, I would obtain the baseline values. Then, uh, and uh, after recording the baseline values, I would uh, proceed with my uh, procedure, with my general anesthesia. I would give uh, fentanyl, uh, third, uh, 50 microgram IV. My patient is 66. How much is the weight of the patient? 66 kgs, sir. In titrated doses, I plan to give in titrated doses. Okay, titrated. So do you think 50 microgram will be good enough for a patient uh, at the time of induction of anesthesia? No, sir. 60 how many and do you give? 65 would be required, sir. Now, how much do you normally give per kg body weight to say to a 40 year old or 50 year old? Two microgram per kilogram, sir. Yeah. So 50 is grossly less for someone who is 60 something, 60 uh, kilos or something. Is that right? Yes, okay. sir. What can be the problem if you give less of fentanyl uh, at the time of induction? There would be an increased stress response, sir. Do you want in this patient? No, sir. You certainly don't want? Yes, sir. So, what are you going to, what, what I'm coming to, <coughs> sorry, ultimately is, as to what are you going to <coughs> do to ensure that there is no pressure response or there is minimal, because this one patient, you can't afford to have any pressure response. That's why I brought you to general anesthesia. Otherwise, you are doing very well with the, with the regional, you had escaped and done well. 
<laughs> first i would keep the patient warm even till the procedure started and also in the process. patient is warm all right i am just asking as to what are you going to do to oh, stress response that pressure response or yes. eliminate pressure response uh one is intubation first is uh, prior to intubation i would give uh, an opioid fentanyl uh, i would give at least a 60 microgram per kilogram oh, so so you have three the dose you are bargain with 10 microgram more from 50 no. come to 60 Hundred billion more than us. Okay. Two uh, microgram per kilogram, one twenty microgram. But okay, two microgram is not going to cause much problem. Okay. okay. Then also to reduce the stress. Has appeared, so we have to be hurry. Uh, we have to uh, finish it fast, please, quickly. Then also uh, to reduce the stress response, I would uh, uh, give a pro, pro. I would induce my patient with proper fall, uh, followed by the initial bolus of. Uh, 60 of a uh, 60 milligram uh, 60 milligram i would uh, give in to, uh, 20 milli uh, 20 milligram aliquots uh, prior to intubation uh, prior to the uh, direct laryngoscopy and also i would keep ready esmolol uh, 30 milligram in case my patient develops a tachycardia uh, i would uh, administer esmolol 30 milligram iv and also the duration of the uh, laryngoscopy i would do smooth swift laryngoscopy uh, limiting it as in duration as much as possible Reduce associated stress response. Then uh, prior yeah, to uh, I differ a bit here. Yes. Rather than the reactive approach, seeing that the patient's pulse rate has gone up or something has happened, then you give all this thing. These drugs should be given uh, preemptively. You can't afford to have any pressure response, any shooting up of blood pressure or uh, pulse rate in this patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all the drugs that you mentioned that I will, uh, you know, keep it ready just in case it happens. You know, don't wait for happening. Prevent it. That's better than treating it. No, okay. Then also, you the patient should be as smooth as possible. To point taken, then what? Uh, then prior to uh, one before intubation procedure, uh, I would uh, give lignocaine also to reduce the stress response. Yes. Uh, I would give. Nah. How much and when? 90 90 mg of uh, lignocaine i would give it 90 seconds uh, prior to the intubation prior to the okay. so 1.5 mg One. per kilogram 90 seconds before uh, yes. laryngoscopy is given okay all right done what next uh, then for the maintenance uh, to uh, for the maintenance of anesthesia I would administer oxygen and nitrous oxide at uh, uh, three to uh, three and three liters per minute each. Along with, I would uh, place uh, a volatile agent. I would keep isoflurane at 0.2 to 1 percent, uh, so as to maintain a mark of one. Uh, the, the time is almost up, so we'll have to hurry up. This patient is going to uh, the recovery now. What yes. quickly? Just tell me what are you going to monitor, and then you are shifting the patient to recovery. And what are the things that you will do, and we'll end it up. Ma'am, is that okay? I think yes, we have sure. more to uh, harass the organizers. Uh, okay, sir. Have, fine. Uh, whole day program. Yes, but uh, quickly. So, in the post anesthesia care unit, we should okay. again uh, keep okay. monitoring his heart rate. Intraop, intraop monitoring quick. Ah. Intraop, uh, we should. Uh, One is, I would ensure adequate fluid status. That the I would look at the heart rate, the BP. They should be maintained within twenty percent of the patient's baseline awake That's normal true. value. Then I would. Uh, patient has to be normothermic then i would monitor his uh, blood glucose level it has to be maintained less than 180 mg per cent pain should be a certain amount of pain can uh, again increase the sympathetic like, stress like, so that could be addressed uh, you have told two more important uh, parameters as here ecg yes or no yes, yes sir, sir. Yes. you didn't say that antidel yes or no yes, yes sir. sir you didn't say that okay post op patient is out in the recovery what what are you going to do there so a patient should be ultimately pain free there should be no sympathetic response uh, so we should uh, keep him pain free how much pain score you will accept on bar scale no. sir one. less than 1 okay. less than 1 that is no pain at all should be absolutely pain free with an epidural insert well all right if you have done a great, a great job you see we are talking about the epidural now we are Talking about uh, general anesthesia, we we came to general anesthesia only because epidural could not be given because of whatever reasons. Okay, there's one thing apart from all that. You see, I will like to end it up already. Uh, we have crossed two three minutes. Uh, yes, there is one thing uh, that you might 
experience in this patient leave aside hypothermia you have discussed well you uh, arrhythmias yes blood pressure shooting up and down anything else that comes to your mind carbon dioxide i should avoid hypothermia hypo hypocarbia can cause both hypocarbia hypocarbia no carbia no oxygen anything else beyond Then, that uh, the patient should be extubated only after adequate no, it is extubated patient is shifted to the recovery without uh, tube okay these patients are likely to have urinary obstruction is a 80 year old man he is likely to have prostate enlargement always look for the bladder if the bladder is full patient will be very restless that also will shoot up uh, his uh, you know parameters blood pressure will go up pulse rate will go up and he will uh, be very uncomfortable ma'am kindly uh, do the closing remarks please okay sir thank you sir for uh, being with us for the past one hour and we on behalf of uh, the uh, twandra medical college and on behalf of our team i thank the isa members for having given us students an opportunity to present here thank you thank you so much for giving me the privilege to uh, be here part of uh, this great program and it's good to see you ma'am uh, linet uh, okay uh, fine sir god bless uh, youngsters uh, young two ladies all the very best you did very well although i had to quit but then it was just to see uh, you know if, if there are any gaps in the information god bless you all the very best thank you sir